screen. And the first thing that I want to give you is our link. That's where we are called advances in AI. And here I am, I'm giving you the bitly link to that, giving it to you on chat. And hello, Tim from Dallas. And hello, Cher from London. Yes, I remember that. But that's our link in case you still don't have it as yet. So once you click on that, you should see exactly that thing. And I see those funny animals. That is you clicking on that link. That allows me to start. So for those people who are new here, and I do appreciate those people who are not new here and uh, friends uh, and uh, acquaintances, but for the new people, uh, that is an overview. I do this overview every week. And honestly, I'm telling you that I get more out of that than you guys because I'm forced to prepare every time I need to know what exactly happened in AI. And this time I'll show it will be a little different. So if you want to know what we did before you go down and uh, there is a, an explanation of every session that we did, it's a bit two years and something more, but uh, that all is recorded. So if you uh, signed in, then you will also get the recording automatically. Uh, but here, we talk about what we will do and I will tell you right away. So I really like to be mysterious and I like to say maybe I will tell you this or that, but I think it's a technical talk and so uh, it's not a mystery show. I will tell you right away what I'm going to tell you. So first of all, in theory, I will talk about how you can talk to your data. Now you can already talk to your uh, documents, right? That you can do very easily. And I think it is getting better and better. So for those people who maybe don't know, you now say ChatGPT. Now they got this domain. And you can say, I want to talk about upload the document. So let's see, do I have any document here? That's a paper. Okay. Let us give them the paper, right? And uh, since it remembers that is a special implementation that it remembers because every time you talk to ChatGPT on the API level, it doesn't remember. That's your implementation in addition. Uh, and you can say then, can you summarize? Summarize. And it understands and it also, you see I misspelled it I think, but it doesn't bother it. It uh, also understands what can you summarize from the context that's clear and so on. So we know that. How about, sorry, not that. Let's go back. How about if you wanted to talk to your database, right? So that is a new thing, which actually we started last time, but nothing worked. I'll show you why it didn't work. Now it all works and I'm crossing my fingers so that it continue working. So that technology comes out of Microsoft, but they are not the first ones. So I prepared three things. Thing number three is their own developer blog, what they have really implemented in the end. Thing number one and two is the previous work. So we will look at that because we will see how the thinking progressed. Uh, but then I will show you uh, working in real life in my local computer and not on their environment, which is our goal. Our goal is to create a copy of whatever we see and make it work on our machine. As you will see, it wasn't completely easy. And I'll, I'll show you what my friends who are helping me what they did to make it work. But we spent another two hours early in the morning so that it would not be just the case of it works on my machine, uh, that's their machine, but also it should work on my machine. And that is already better and that is what I'm showing. So let us start. The, our problem is we would love to be able to ask questions. The very simple question that 
uh, your RAG model, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Your RAG model doesn't know is what collection you are looking at that, right? If you prepare a billion documents and send them to Pinecone, let us say, or any other vector database, and then you ask how many documents do you have in your collection, then it will just say, I do not know, because the reg model does this, takes every document, breaks it into meaningful pieces, usual paragraphs, and sends it into the database. It doesn't know how many lines it has all together. Plus, the uh, vector database is an, uh, a NoSQL database. And therefore, it really doesn't know a NoSQL query helps. All right. So uh, what if you could also talk to your data? Would be also nice. It's not automatic, but today it is. So the whole story started with Wiki SQL. Let's go there. Let's look at this Wiki SQL. That, I think, is the paper that I just uploaded for ChatGPT to summarize. And it keeps summarizing anyway. Between me and you, ChatGPT is stupid. It doesn't understand. It's not genius. But that's something we will address later. Right now, we will ask what it can do as opposed to what it cannot do. So that was the first work. The first work is interesting because it explains right away what it does. Here you are, and summary done by humans is much better than the ChatGPT because humans understand. So here you are. And they talk about that there is a great interest to talk to your data, but it's not easy. Their approach here is based on neural networks. Of course, everything is based on neural network, but also they use, uh, I think, rewards, rewards from in the loop query. That is, as we know, the second step in training AI. So the first step, you give it all the information and also what is politically correct. What is politically incorrect is called by humanity toxic. Now, that all depends upon which part of humanity you talk to because the terrorists will say that they are not toxic. So that is a very relative term, but it's a standard term people use. So in, in ChatGPT, you first train it to answer, and then you adjust it to political correctness. I have actually uh, signed up to be this human in the loop, but never did it. Don't tell them that I didn't really intend it, but there was a company, it's called Outlier, and you can log in, anybody can use this link, and they pay $70 an hour while you are in training, and then I think $25 an hour or 30 when you are doing it for real, and I looked at the questions. So if they ask you, is that a good question, uh, and is that a good answer? I signed up as a mathematician, so they were giving me examples of what is the right answer, and I mean, what the chat GPT or, or any other model is, uh, things is the right answer. That was last time, and I showed you that, and that was just my investigation into that. I, I By the way, the, there is an idea that if you don't intend to buy something, then it's incorrect to ask about the pricing. But here, I think I wasn't fooling anybody. I didn't promise that I will work for them. And um, by the way, my excuse is that I had that in mind that I might work for them. So I was good there emotionally and uh, ethically. All right, going back. Going back here, that is the same thing that they suggest here. So it is a human in the loop. In addition to a query, ask a query translation using your own neural network, but that was 2018. That was way before uh, the LLM, the large language models came into the fore. So we see the basic idea, but we will also see that things change. So good, good investigation into this. And another work here that preceded 
the current one is this Yale. Hosted at Yale University and called Spider, it is a benchmark. So everybody can compete here. There are multiple benchmarks for AI. And this one is a leaderboard for I want to translate my question in natural language into SQL. And it's interesting. The previous paper, by the way, by the way was from Waterloo University, and some of the people were entrepreneurs. And so it's a, it's a very interesting mix of people. But here, this is anonymous. So it's amazing. Code and paper coming soon, but gets the best results. So you cannot not publish it. Uh, but that is from Alibaba, from China, anonymous uh, Alberta, as I told you. Canada is quite a leader, and there's a good reason they're quite a leader is because uh, Marvin Minsker, I think, Minsky, he wrote uh, an article that killed all AI for 10 years in the U.S., and, uh, and that was the freeze of AI. But in Canada, they continued. That, that's one of the reasons why they quite lead in that. Uh, Elias Sutskever is from Canada. All right, so we see that, we see uh, the ideas, we see that, but what's, what is really working in the end is found right here. So you, you need to go to Microsoft and find out what they call semantic kernel. That's their name for that. So let's see. And what they say, and that's an advertisement for their actual system. What they say here, and you can go and uh, watch the video, but I think that uh, the course that Andrew Ng published plus the notebook, notebook in Python does a better job. Anyway, so that's what they explained here. They said that there was all this previous work, but that I think is smoke because that previous work is not what they do and not what they offer. And so they say, well, it is not bad, blah, blah, blah. But the end result is that we just test chat GPT. So if you want to really know how does chat GPT answer that, how it can take your natural language statement and convert it to SQL, you, I think, will not find it at all. So go ahead and search and correct me if I'm wrong. But I think they just ask uh, ChatGPT a question and it just gives them the answer. That's the end result. So I started by telling that I will explain how it works and I ended by, by saying, well, that really is magic. That is how it works. So uh, I, I saw it somewhere that they start by saying, here are the five approaches that are non-starter and will not work. But in the end, all these links you can see in the end, they just give you the end result. All right. If they give you the end result, let's go there. So what I'm showing you right now is PyCharm. PyCharm is a tool that is for working with Python. But as I discovered today, you can make this PyCharm run your notebooks. Well, I didn't know that. And this is a notebook. It's an IPYMB. I'm opening that here. And you install the correct, the correct plugin, and it runs uh, out of here. Well, up until now, I was always showing you the Jupyter, Jupyter Lab environment. So I was developing in that environment, but when it comes to running, I was running it in an outside. And today my friend told me that, look, I'm developing here, but because of that, you tend to do this. You tend to say, oh, it works on my machine. Sorry, I don't know why it doesn't work on yours. So yes, that is a good approach. And that's what we made work in the end. But that was a classical case of works on my machine, but not on, on this one. In the end result, I have something to show you. So let us start. What we're doing here is 
Now let, let's start from here, right? Importing all the uh, libraries and please note Azure Chat OpenAI. It uses ChatGPT, but it uses the Microsoft version. So you pay to Microsoft. And also it uh, is using other little conveniences for Microsoft, but basically it is ChatGPT. So you import that library. It says, okay, I got it. Then you do a, a usual Python trick, and that is you load all of your parameters that you don't want to be seen. These parameters you import from .env. .env at the root of the project. It's not even here because that's a sub-project, sub-directory within the main project, which is called OpenAI Labs, where I collect all the labs related to AI, not only OpenAI. So at that point, it found it. And at that point right here, it got all the parameters here. And then it says, translate this sentence. Now, don't look at that because it's already a result because I didn't refresh it. But let's go step by step. Here, we're saying that is what I want you to do. So just to prove the fact that I'm connecting to uh, OpenAI through Microsoft, and then Model Invoke sends that message. So let's see what happens. I'm sending the message and it is thinking, and that is how it shows. Now, uh, last time I read from a picture, which was not fair, but then I didn't have it worked out. But now you can read it, Jean-Louis Rouge, uh, Le Maison Bleu, and so on. You can also, Me gustan los coches rojos, you can also translate it into Spanish, it worked. And that is the picture that we don't need anymore. All right. No big deal. We just proved that, yes, you can uh, ask ChatGPT something. So let's go to the next one. That one is really talking to the data. That data happens to live right here. You can see it in the data directory. That should be here. It's somewhere, really. There, there you are. We read it from the data. So let's go ahead and try to do it. Let's start. Again, we import the libraries. If you want to know what libraries, you click on those dots and you see pretty much the same libraries. You see that we're going to talk to ChatGPT, but now we're going to use the pandas. Pandas is a Python library that helps you work with rectangular arrays of data. Think of them as a spreadsheet, think of them as a, a comma separated value, but that's data or a database table later on. So you get this and let's see if it works. Yes. And then you find again your .env file, which gives you the parameters that you want to be hidden. Here you are, got them. Now I'm setting up Azure Chat Open AI. And I'm giving it which API version I want, the latest uh, deployment. So that has to be the, the, um, the Azure deployment. You need to look in the Microsoft, get your account and copy that. Then you also get the key, which allows you to talk. I'm talking from my local computer to the Amazon cloud. And Azure Endpoint is where I'm addressing my question. All right, so nothing happens because I just copied that information. The next step is get the data set. So and the data is right here, right here. Let me show you, there you are. It is all states history about something. And if I run that, then I can obtain the data and put it into a GF data frame. So I'm reading CSV and filling uh, non-available values with zero so that I don't have NA letters because they will ruin the algorithm. And now I'm reading that, okay? I read it. Well, so far, nothing groundbreaking. Now I want to set up the parameter that will know about my data. 
and I will be able to ask a, a question. So let's do that. Boom. Now it's thinking, how many rows do I really have? As it is thinking, and that is, of course, already fascinating. As it is thinking, it's telling you what it's thinking. It says thought. To determine the number of rows, I can use the shape attribute of the data frame. Yes, if you're in Python, you can do it. And it says, and that's what I will do. Action, df shape. That's the shape. That's your number. Well, I would prefer it to use some SQL statement, but that will come later. It knows that it's dealing with Python. It knows that there is a shape there. Why go any more complex? So finish chain is how many rows are there? And output, there are 20,780 rows. I could verify that. If I don't believe it, I could do it myself. In that case, it's no point because I believe that he probably did do the shape. Now, by the way, why did I mention that I don't have to believe it? Well, that is because ChatGPT number one lies, it hallucinates, and number two doesn't understand. Doesn't understand is out of scope here because we're dealing with data. Easy. Okay. Now let's do something more complex. Let's ask this question. Let's run that. First, okay. and then let's look at what we're doing. Okay, it's already executed, but I let it execute. I want to see what I'm asking. First, set the panzer display option to show all the columns, get the column name, and then answer the question. That's my instruction to it. And by now, we see the power because it's kind of what you would say to a junior associate, you know, I want you to investigate the data. So here are all the instructions. Please note how many instructions are there because the way, the proper way to chat, to talk to LLM is by giving a lot of instructions. A, it will figure it out. That's better than uh, say just very brief, like investigate the data and it has to guess your mind, which it cannot, of course. Uh, even human, not everyone guesses your mind. So this is a long prompt. Try this. If the methods that you try don't give you a result, then show me and explain what happened. Well, that's already, you can read the instruction. The uh, uh, All of that is uh, in the repository. The link to repository is in the, in here. That's exactly it. Let me show you. And the repository is open and it's all yours, except that it is right now not on the main lane, but on Neha branch. That's where it would be with much more instructions. And then I'm going to merge it into Mark and then I'll put it into main. So that's just a day or two, but let's go. It's here. What it's doing is, I think it's still thinking, but let's uh, follow its line of reason. Entering new exact agent executed shape. So first of all, executed is becoming a very popular term. Whether it is an agent, I'm an agent. Whether it is a real agent or it's like an agent, Andrew Ain suggests, uh, let's call it agentic. But in any case, it's somebody who is specialized in this kind of learning or doing, in this case, SQL agent. And we see that it is called agent where we created, it should have a name. Agent create pandas data frame agent. So that agent will specifically talk to a pandas data frame and you can ask questions. Now, when it does uh, ask these questions, then uh, uh, action input, import pandas as PD, yes. And then do the number of columns. And what other things did I ask it to do? 
how many patients were hospitalized during July 2021 in Texas, or that is where I am, and nationwide, as to the total of all states used this hospitalized, hospitalized increase column. A well, human would understand it. And that's already if that human works with data and SQL. Now AI also understands it. So it begins thinking. That's where it is. It says these are the columns that I see. And it says, I'm thinking now. I see the column names, but to answer the question about the number of patients hospitalized during July 2021, I need to filter the data frame based on the date column to get entries for July 2021 and then some of the hospitalized and hospitalized cumulative values. I, I think that's quite amazing. That is what a, an associate would tell you, but now AI tells it. However, it's not clear from the current data preview which column exactly to use or how the data is structured across. I'll first check how the date values are formatted and then proceed to filter. Okay, please vote if you think it's amazing. So I'm going to chat. Please vote. Last one, if you okay. So keep in mind, I'm not selling anything. I don't work for Microsoft. And uh, uh, I do have my own. Okay, thank you, Jensen. I have my own use case for you later on. Tim, yes, thank you. And uh, if at least two people think, yes, it's amazing, why is not the whole world doing this? Of course, I just learned about it. So I don't count. And Julio, all right. But I think it's quite great. Let's go on. I already showed that you already asked how about connecting to the real database. I'll do that next. So it keeps thinking, it keeps giving you his reasoning, and then it gives the results. In the end, it gives you the final answer. He, I think, also noticed a skew somewhere and said something is suspicious. I think he went down. Like this consistency suggests, so it's doing some analysis. Finish chain, that is all the summary. You can make a research report out of that. All right, I invite you to do it because, uh, well, at least in a day or two, that will be in every branch. But for now, you can use the Neha branch and get clone and then use that. Well, okay, so I said, let's also look at connecting to an SQL database. But here, I will disappoint you because nothing special happens. If you put it into a database that is built in, if you put it into an in-memory database, then no install is needed, no username, no password. It's just that it will reside in memory in a SQL database, and therefore, it will work much faster, right? So let's see, what are we importing? We're importing everything, but we're also importing SQL database toolkit because we are going to use that. So let's go run it. Here, we got it and we found it, load data and ENV. And, and by the way, I don't have to click. I can do shift enter just like you do with the a regular node, notebooks. Okay, so now the data is coming from the same CSV, it's right here. But after that, we loaded, so here's the data. I got the data, that's the same thing as I did before in the previous one, but now I'm going to put it into the database. So I'm creating a database, create engine, it is SQLite, which by the way, my Freed also uses that. So it is an in-memory uh, database, I thought just 
Java, but I am wrong in Python also and many other languages. So now I do the same thing, but with the SQL. So I prepare a, a data in the SQL. That's a technical issue, just move it there. But what we're going to do is SQL prompt. And now, since it can do every query much faster, we're going to give it a very long prompt. Let me do this. Let me look in the chat. Explainable or justifiable is a good question. That, I think, is explainable. Justifiable is a moral term. Would you agree? So I think it doesn't do that, even though the last course, which I'm not even presenting, but the last course is kind of about moral justification. It measures your CO2 impact on the environment. Uh, and I didn't see any big technical uh, uh, merit in that, but it would be kind of justifiable. Now, Greg asks a great question. What kind of metadata is useful to add for SQL or CSV table? My objective is to develop a general system that works with a very low error rate and consistent over time and uses. I was thinking of prompt engineering that is table specific. It seems, Greg, that they got it. They, they got your table. They got uh, ideal prompts that they show. And therefore, you don't need table specific. All you need is to give it the data. And it will figure out from there, which seems quite magical. So that's why I investigated, I looked at it, and it seems that they don't tell you anywhere how they really do it. Now, we know one thing about ChatGPT and the OpenAI, that there are two approaches. Approach number one, I'm not giving you tools, I'm not teaching you anything, it will figure it out. That's why it was pretty bad at math at first. But the guys insisted, they wanted to say, let it learn, I'm not telling you the answers. I'm waiting till it learns. It seems from that, what they said is that it is constantly learning and they were waiting for it to learn good math. So I think the math became much better, but another approach is to allow it to use tools. And that already happened. So now it can whip up a calculator and do their calculation for you. Therefore, I was addressing your question. You were thinking about prompt engineering that is table specific, and maybe they've done it. So maybe you are thinking, Greg, about how you would do it, but it seems uh, that they resigned to just saying it's pure magic. I don't know. Uh, but as maybe you can investigate and tell us next time. I was thinking of factoring prompt engineer for the application task. But I have to tell you that I'm thinking about the same things. How to make very smart AI agents. This is an example of quite smart AI agent, but the area is quite well defined, SQL. So I'm thinking about other areas. For example, I want to have an agent that will know about gas chromatography and defend people in court when they were drunk while driving. So what exactly you should say, but it's not done yet. Okay, any case, let's go back to where we are. Let's look at the prompt. That's a long prompt. And it's at what to do and what not to do. Look at that. Do not make any email statements. So don't change my data. By the way, listen to me. Do not make up any answers. Don't use prior knowledge. Very, we understand where that is coming from. Your response should be in markdown. And then it says, don't invent new table names. Use only the ones that aren't there. Oh, okay, do not make up table names. Only use the tables returned by any of the tools below. But then they give the tools. Here are the tools. What are the tools? I think it's SQL. Well, let's run it because that's becoming very interesting. Well, we prepared everything. 
we're preparing the LLM expert and all of that. We ask it to be temperature zero, which means always give the same result. Don't fantasize and don't overdo it. Don't send too many tokens. It's 500. And now let's run it. Okay, it's ready. We go on. That's the question. And you see that line that's moving shows that it's still working, it's still thinking. It thinks, it gives you the intermediate results. It thinks out loud. That's what it does. Of course, in that lab, now that you have the lab working, uh, you know it will work, more or less, because it's prepared. In real cases, I don't know. It might crash, but I let it run. Well, let's go to the chat and let's see what the people say. Okay. Data table, structured data, metadata embedded in the table. In other words, you're asking, does it have anything in addition to the data itself? I think not. I think it has just the data. It is exactly the same data. First of all, you can verify the data here. And secondly, uh, that data is pure CSV, which was then loaded into the database, but it was just loaded, nothing added. So I think, no, there is no metadata. Nothing embedded on the table. It's purely looking at uh, their system. Here is your spreadsheet and do whatever. Except that do whatever is a very long instruction. Okay, it ended thinking. It said finished chain, final result. That includes all trials, all attempts to do something that didn't work. And finally, it says how many patients were hospitalized in New York and nationwide and the answer in a October, uh, New York reported no increase in hospitalization, while nationwide there was a total increase of 53.485. Well, what's next? Well, let's go back. We saw that. Let's go back here. And that's where we were. And I didn't say it. But what I mean here is to say use cases. So Andrew Ng in the beginning of that course invites you to say, and maybe guys, you will do something in your company. That's the enticement. What I'm thinking about is uh, e-discovery. For those who are familiar with the e-discovery and for those who are not, uh, e-discovery is when two companies kind of fight and uh, one says, give me all your emails about what you think about me, kind of. And that is loaded into the e-discovery system, and I'm running one of such systems. So after, after that's loaded, you need to know what happened. And the old way, and I don't think there is a new way as yet, but the old way is to be familiar with the manager of your case. It's a whole story that I'm not going into, but there is a manager and you want to ask him, well, tell me uh, one quick second. Don't you, can I call you back? Okay, so uh, you are friendly with the manager and usually people say, well, I have a good friend, the manager and I can ask any special question because those questions are usually to the SQL representation of your data. And they are not simple. It's kind of what uh, that was uh, explained in our lab. Like, was there any influence of this on that? And the manager knows SQL, he knows your data, he knows how to ask, well, that's my use case. Can you imagine, I don't need to know any manager, right? I don't, it's like knowing travel agent, no more. I know the website. 
And uh, I know a website that knows all the other websites. So that here too, my use case and that on the side, trying learning to implement as soon as I can, that you can ask questions about your data represented in SQL. In addition to all the other things that the discovery does, yeah, I'll show you real quick and I hope it works today. Let's say, Then, does it work? No, maybe then it doesn't work. How about this one? Okay, so that is this tool for your discovery. You can do search here if you click here, but you can also say uh, any question that you want. That's AI. Well, that AI will add also uh, the questions that you can ask about the data. That's because search asks about specific documents, like show me all the documents. Just five documents to start with. AI asks, answers questions about document contents. There you Then let me see. Is there such a person? I don't know. Okay. Uh, is there Susan? Maybe I'm not asking you. Really. Okay. Oh, something is not connected. But in any case, you can really ask questions about the document content. Now you should be able to ask questions about the whole collection. Okay, something must break and it did break, very nice. But that would be my, uh, my use case. I'm amazed why people don't do it up until now, but maybe I don't know. All right, now let me do this. Let me stop share. Let me stop talking. And let me say any questions. And also ask any suggesting things for it is natural language, it's kind of ML to SQL. No special questions. So great, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that because uh, uh, you guys pushed me into learning and the end result is that we both gain. I wish you a very good week, a very good weekend. I get a very good weekend, a very good year. Thank you, Jensen. Thank you, Sharon, available to you on that link. All the best, bye-bye.